The logic of nihilism leads inexorably to the abyss. He who will not return to truth must follow error to its end. So says Father Seraphim Rose in Nihilism, the Root of the Revolution of the Modern Age. And uh, that's the book I'm going to be looking at today. Now, in future, I will have physical copies of most of the books I'll be reviewing for this. But um, as far as this book goes, it's actually only just over 100 pages long. It's uh, it's two essays compiled. One of them is about 100 pages. The other one is about 17 pages. So I didn't purchase a, a physical copy of this. And that's something to bear in mind if, if someone is thinking of buying this book. Uh, because this was actually one chapter of what was going to be the magnum opus of Seraphim Rose, but he passed before he completed it and this was all that was published. So this is much more like a, a long form essay on the topic of uh, nihilism and the dialectic of nihilism, as he calls it in the modern world. But who is Seraphim Rose and uh, why should anyone care? Well, Seraphim Rose was an American Orthodox monk, writer, philosopher, uh, bishop before he died. And he came from an interesting background because he was sort of a typical um, American well-to-do wasp um, practitioner of, of uh, sort of Protestant Christianity, um, quite typical of his time. But in the, you know, in his adulthood, he left behind all that, became very atheistic, became a follower of Nietzsche. And in the 1950s, he actually um, completed a course under Alan Watts, who a lot of people will be familiar with. He's obviously lived on in his, uh, in his speeches, which are quite popular on YouTube now. And that was uh, Seraphim Rose's interest in his adult life was Eastern mysticism, Taoism, Buddhism, these kinds of things. So he studied under Alan Watts and then completed a, a master's degree in um, Oriental languages. And uh, the other person that was quite influential on him was uh, René Ganon and the traditional school, which should give you an idea of uh, what kind of background he was coming from. If you want an introduction to the traditional school, you can uh, look at my video, Introduction to Traditionalism. So he was influenced by Ganon, this idea that there's a, a primordial truth that um, all religious traditions are individual instantiations of the one primordial uh, perennial philosophy. And he was influenced by a, a Taoist uh, to begin to study texts in their original form. And he, he took up this idea that it's very, in, it's very important to read texts as they were originally written. And so he, uh, he began to learn Oriental languages and uh, Mandarin and these kinds of things, just so he could read these religious texts. So he had this sort of um, perennialist, traditionalist uh, approach. But what actually brought him to orthodoxy was he had a, a mystical experience of sorts in a Russian Orthodox church in, in San Francisco where he lived. And, uh, you know, he described it as that he'd always been sort of outside of these traditions. He'd been studying them as a philosopher. But when he entered the Orthodox church, he said he had a feeling of sort of coming home and a, a feeling that this was his tradition. This was the truth. And so he became a, a great popularizer of Orthodox Christianity. His works were popular in the US, they were popular in the Soviet Union uh, under Samizdat. Um, and this work, uh, The Root of the Revolution of the Modern Age, is very interesting. Uh, it's quite short, as I said, but it packs a punch. And it covers what he describes as the dialectic of nihilism. And that's an interesting phrase to use because Right off the bat for Father Rose, uh, nihilism is, is quite simply the denial of objective truth. Um, the idea that there, there is nothing beyond us, everything is subjective. There are no answers to the big questions. And he takes as a certain point uh, Nietzsche's description of, of nihilism and he references Nietzsche quite a lot. And some would say maybe even unfairly characterizes Nietzsche as sort of the prime nihilist because a lot of people would say that Nietzsche himself was trying to overcome nihilism and recognizing this problem. But nevertheless, the idea of, of describing a dialectic of nihilism is interesting because he pinpoints four sort of stages of the dialectic of nihilism, which is liberalism, realism, vitalism, and destructive nihilism, um, just totalizing nihilism. Um, but these aren't 
totally separate phrases, uh, phases. You know, realism isn't totally separate from liberalism. Vitalism isn't totally separate from realism. But these kind of follow each other logically and they sort of build on each other. And they're really all coming from the same problem as Sarah from Rose sees it, which is, uh, you know, nihilistic relativism. Um, but there's a difference of emphasis that sort of follows necessarily, you know, liberalism kind of leads necessarily to realism and realism leads necessarily to vitalism. And the end result of all of this is the nihilism of destruction, as he terms it, which is, you know, Bolshevism, anarchism, just this totalizing um, destructive force, uh, the destruction of all higher values, of all traces of civilization. But he, he's not willing to give liberalism a, a pass on this, and this is why it's important to trace it as a dialectic. Because this is something we're familiar with a lot today, is um, people that will attack much of the symptoms of, of the nihilism of the age, but try and hark back to uh, an older form of liberalism when people were more religious, more moral. Jordan Peterson and these types do this a lot, you know, they recognise many of the same problems uh, that Father Sarah from Rose would about modernity, but they believe that in classical liberalism, um, the answers were sort of already there. Or there was nothing necessary in classical liberalism that could have led to this kind of nihilism. And that's where Sarah from Rose really disagrees, and that's why it's important for him to trace the dialectic. Because what Sarah from Rose says characterises the liberal stage of the dialectic of nihilism is precisely that sort of passive aspect. It's not this kind of active nihilism of a Nietzsche. It's not affirming that, you know, God is dead and there are no transcendent values. In fact, it actually relies on a popular belief in those values. And he talks about this, you know, liberals will pay lip service to things like truth, um, rights, um, you know, brotherhood of man, these kinds of things. But really, you know, for, for Sarah from Rose, he's influenced by Nietzsche, but he's not entirely dismissive of Nietzsche in that he sees Nietzsche as an important figure in Christianity because Nietzsche recognises um, how totalising a force nihilism is and why the death of God is so significant. And in a certain sense, you know, Sarah from Rose was quoted as saying that you know, that kind of denial of God and that kind of full force, uh, full frontal attack on God is, is sort of coming from a place of religiosity, which may sound paradoxical, but he much prefers that full on nihilism um, and sort of anti-theism to the sort of passive um, live and let live nihilism of liberalism. Because, you know, Sarah from Rose says that people in the, the liberal stage of the dialectic, they pay lip service to these things, but no one really believes it. And liberalism is this sort of doubt. It's this this lack in the in in the the fullness of belief of the transcendent, and it can only survive for so long because for a liberal society to function, of course, you have to have um, things like respect for the rule of law. You can't have everyone being a uh, a complete nihilist and and satanist. That's uh, uh, that's acting purely under self interest, or you know, you get what we're getting today. And Sarah from Rose recognizes this. But that's why he has such a problem with specifically the liberal stage of the dialectic is because these things are let fester under the surface and no one really takes these things seriously anymore when, you know, that is really the the ultimate effect of nihilism because if these things actually mattered, if people believed in these things, they should be front and centre of everyone's life. Like these are the important questions that we should be dedicating our life to pursuing as Sarah from Rose did. Now, when you get to the realist stage of the dialectic, and this is probably a, a surprising one for people. Why would realism be included as as a kind of nihilism? And when he when he says realism, what's he talking about? He's talking about positivists, logical positivists, materialists, um, you know, scientism as a belief, which is probably a lot more relevant now than it was when he was writing this. I mean, I know when he was writing this, you know, you had people like uh, you know the logical positivists like Bertrand Russell. But it's, I think this is much more prevalent now with the sort of worship of pop science that people like Carl Sagan started and that, you know, now, now you have like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye and Richard Dawkins and all these people. And uh, Dawkins and the New Atheist School would really be a good exemplification of what he's talking about when he complains about realism. So the difference between liberalism and realism is really one of emphasis. And you could think of it as the difference between 
deism and materialism. A lot of the, the founding fathers of the US were, were liberals and their liberalism was underpinned by this kind of vague deism. Well, in realism, it, it goes to full scale materialism. And uh, Father Rose really sees this as a kind of Tower of Babel project where all elements of the transcendent, even the, you know, the ones that were kind of presupposed by liberalism, perhaps are, are moved out of the way. And uh, the focus becomes on the worship of the natural and on the <clears throat> the intense study of, of natural processes and science becomes this uh, becomes the top of of the hierarchy of knowledge. And realism, uh, Father Rose says, can only survive for so long. Because again, the the sort of roots of, of its collapse into the next stage of this degenerative process are already there because Father Rose says that no one except the, the dullest kind of person can remain satisfied with this kind of materialism. You know, it, it's, it's lacking that sort of vital impulse. And again, this is something that Nietzsche recognised, that science would not be fit to uh, replace religion to fill in for the death of God because... Uh, again, it lacks this sort of existential aspect. For Sarah from Rose, it's it's only the the you know the worst kind of people that can that can make this into a complete worldview. And so, what you inevitably get are the eccentrics, or the artists, or the philosophers that try and plug the gap of religion. Realism makes clear uh, the crisis. It presents us with this materialist, uh, this naturalist explanation of things. You get things like Darwinism that more and more explain away things that used to be left for the sacred. And so what you get is you get this, this impulse of, of, um, of intellectuals, of artists to try and fill that gap. And this is where vitalism comes in. Um, and maybe vitalism isn't something people are as familiar with because Vitalism was really more of a, a 20th century trend, I suppose, where you had people like Henri Bergson, the philosopher, that had this idea that there was a, a land vital, like a, a vital force, um, power in life. But Seraphim Rose is using it much more generally. So he's applying it to like uh, sort of pantheism. He's applying it to sort of new age beliefs. All of these kinds of airy fairy beliefs uh, that, you know, there's like a, some kind of... Uh, a uh, higher being, like if we are the universe. Uh, he includes like the the quest for um, spiritual experiences, uh, the sort of uh, popularity of Zen among a certain kind of person, and uh, he believes it has its ultimate fulfillment at this stage in uh, the pursuing of of religious experiences through drugs and through through psychedelic experiences. So vitalism is this kind of vague transcendentalism where people are trying to plug that gap of the death of God and their nihilism turns to this kind of perennialism or occultism where, um, you know, they're trying to sort of have the nice aspects of religion and they're trying to sort of slap that on what is still a, a, a sort of naturalist explanation of things. Sarah from Rose thinks that vitalism is more dangerous than realism because Realism is this more kind of honest rebellion against Christianity and against truth. Whereas vitalism recognizes the need for some kind of higher purpose, the need for some kind of greater narrative, but tries to sublimate those uh, desires that Seraphim Rose would see as, as sort of an inherent calling to God, to truth, to Christ, and tries to subvert them into these sort of primitive impulses. And you can see the vitalist trend in a lot of early modernists. What you find in the, the current of modernism is there's an attempt to go beyond modernity by sort of going back to some sort of ideal primitivism. And you see this, you know, with Freud explaining everything via the id, via the sex drive. You see it with the the, the sort of worship of the primitive and the idea of, of, of the noble savage. And you see it with a lot of modern art that's um, very sort of focused on, on the primal and that uh, tries to sort of bring back um, these sort of tribal themes. And, and uh, there's this trend in modernism where there's this kind of worship of, of the other, worship of people that are sort of outside of civilization and this sort of rejection of civilizational tendencies. And it is this kind of pseudo spirituality of trying to return to um, some kind of ideal 
um, you know, harmonic existence with nature. And so Seraphim Rose would also include like neo-paganism and this kind of thing. And he actually also includes um, fascism and national socialism where uh, the state um, and the, the progress of history is given this sort of vital impulse or, or blood and soil in the case of national socialist Germany. And he definitely sees the futurists and the futurist impulse behind fascism as really a very pure form of nihilism because, you know, you read some of the early Italian futurists and they're very excited about the prospect of tearing down the old world, of, of tearing down traditional norms and tearing down the old social order, tearing down all the remnants of, of the old age. And uh, so the, you know, the old religious impulses are uh, transmuted onto this uh, onto this promise of, of inevitable progress. And uh, again, this life force or this vital force um, progressing into the future and us progressing as a species. And this leads to the final stage of the nihilist dialectic, which is just the nihilism of destruction. And he, he doesn't write a whole lot on this, but I think his examples are quite illustrative. Uh, specifically someone like Mikhail Bakunin uh, or Proudhon. So he's looking at anarchists and he's looking at the Bolsheviks. And for him, Bolshevism is really the final stage in, in the nihilist dialectic. It's the nihilism of destruction. And he even says that, you know, the the nihilism of 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 fascist Europe was was not sufficient, but it did a lot to tear down some of the remnants of the old order to clear the way for this uh, absolute nihilism of Bolshevism. And, you know, he, he uses quotes from people like Bakunin and Proudhon that talk in this kind of way as if their project is a kind of Satanist one, you know, that they, uh, uh, I think it was Proudhon that coined the term anti-theist, and Bakunin writes about, you know, if, if there was a God that it wouldn't even matter if he existed because we would rebel against him anyway, because, you know, that is just, they turn this sort of revolutionary impulse into a kind of religious impulse. And, you know, you can think of, of modern day anarchists and Antifa, and this has been observed a lot, is there's a lot of times there isn't really a coherent belief system there among them, but what there is, is this kind of destructive impulse, destructive desire um, this lashing out and violence, um, anti-social behaviour, you know, that th they seem to have these things in common, even if there isn't really a coherent body of belief uniting them. And Seraphim Rose just sees this as the end point of nihilism. These are the people that are taking nihilism to its absolute conclusion. And ultimately, it is a, a product of destruction. And so what ni nihilism inevitably leads to and this goes back to the whole dialectic of, of nihilism is the destruction of the old world, the destruction of, of the remnants of Christian civilization, the creation of the new world, and finally the creation of a new man. And this is something that's found a lot in 20th century modernism, in political beliefs of the 20th century. Certainly Soviet communism talked a lot about the new man. Che Guevara wrote about the, you know, the Nietzsche and Ubermensch being the, the communist new man. Fascism, you can see it in the propaganda, uh, eugenicists in the 20th century. So the idea of, of the new man becomes very important. And this is really the final stage of the nihilist dialectic, because what's happened? We've done away with God, we've done away with absolute truth, we've done away with religion. And we've gone through this process of, of, uh, of trying to find this sort of vague transcendentalism of of turning the worship of the natural sciences and the worship of the material world into some kind of weak substitute for religion with things like positivism. And finally, we have the most absolute destructive tendencies come to the fore in, in Bolshevism and in the, in the various leftist anarchisms and so on. But what the, the very end result of all of this is, is the creation of the new man. And what is the new man? Well, here, this is one place where I'll read a passage from Seraphim Rose, because I think this is a, a brilliant uh, description of, of the, the failed project of modernity, um, the inherent problem of, of trying to create this new man that is, that is uh, completely sort of alienated and on another plane and separate from, from tradition and from nationality and from religion and so on. He says... What more realistically is this mutation, the new man, 
He is the ruthless man, discontinuous with a past that nihilism has destroyed, the raw material of every demagogue's dream, the free thinker and skeptic, closed only to the truth but open to each new intellectual fashion because he himself has no intellectual foundation, the seeker after some new revelation ready to believe anything, because true faith has been annihilated in him, the planner and the experimenter worshipping fact because he has abandoned truth, seeing the world as a vast laboratory in which he is free to determine what is possible. The autonomous man pretending to the humility, if only asking his rights, yet full of the pride that expects everything to be given to him in a world where nothing is authoritatively forbidden. The man of the moment, without conscience or values, and thus at the mercy of the strongest stimulus. The rebel, hating all restraint and authority, because he himself is his own and only God. The mass man, this new barbarian, thoroughly reduced and simplified and capable of only the most elementary ideas, yet scornful of anyone who presumes to point out the higher things or the real complexity of life. I think that's a, a brilliant passage and really applies a lot more to what we see today. And I mean, that is the description of modern man. You know, it is someone that is completely ruthless, that is that feels themselves to be free of all tradition and that derives a sense of pride from newness and experimentation and sort of being, you know, being hip with the, the new social agendas, being on board with, uh, with whatever the political, the political orthodoxy is, um, uh, taking this sort of uh, approach to the arts and, uh, and, and whatever else, where it's, it's all about novelty, it's all about newness, it's all about understanding the latest trends. Someone that is just completely cut off from the eternal or anything of eternal significance has no way to place things in their historical contingency, has no way to relate things to something higher, has no way to judge things through the, the true, the beautiful, the good, but is just in, in chase of sort of perpetual novelty and is a ruthless consumer. And so Father Sarah from Rose comes to the conclusion that a lot of writers on modernity have come to, which is that once all of these things are stripped away, once religion is stripped away, once truth is stripped away, once um, the, you know, these traditional institutions are, are stripped away, what you're left with is techniques. What you're left with is technology and uh, a mass of consumers, a mass of, of biomass that's there to be to be moulded by the state, to be moulded by the planners, to be moulded by technology. And, you know, without a higher purpose, what we're left with is, you know, we are consuming animals. And so the new man that communism promised, the new man of the 20th century that would be free, that would be free of all of these old superstitions and, and uh, barriers to self-expression, ultimately becomes more enslaved than ever, because while he's free of the, the so-called, you know, superstitions of Christianity, now he has nothing higher to relate himself to. He just becomes a slave of his passions and he becomes a slave of the planners, the economic planners, the capitalists. And so I think Sarah from Rose does an excellent job in pinpointing how all of this was there um, in potential, in liberalism, in the Enlightenment, in humanism, and that the most extreme forms of nihilism that we see in Bolshevism and communism in the modern world are really all expressions of this um, this kernel of untruth that is nihilism that's present in liberalism and in the Enlightenment. And so Sarah from Rose proves time and time again that as soon as you start to deny anything objective, as soon as you start to deny a world beyond you, that the most extreme forms of relativism become inevitable and that all of these things, whether it's transcendentalism, whether it's new age beliefs, whether it's uh, positivism, whether it's scientism, whether it's communism, whether it's fascism, he sees all of them have a kind of kernel of truth in them. They're all coming from a, a, a good impulse in some sense, but they're all mistaken and they're all starting from a position of a denial of the objective, a denial of truth. And so it is inevitable that they will end in horror and that they won't be able to answer the conditions of our day. And so for him, the only answer is Christianity. For him, this whole project is a kind of satanic project. And it is sort of unconsciously oftentimes in direct rebellion against Christianity. But there's only certain kinds of writers like Nietzsche, like Dostoevsky, who can pinpoint this. 
And so while Nietzsche and Dostoevsky are in agreement about the condition of nihilism, uh, they differ on the solution. And Sarah from Rose sees uh, Nietzsche as an expression of nihilism. His, his solutions are just as much an expression of nihilism. And Sarah from Rose very much sides with Dostoevsky in that the answer is a return to the faith, is a return to the tradition of the Orthodox Church. So this is an excellent read for just over 100 pages. Um, that closing passage is really one of the most important passages. And I think it, it does highlight something which is, but again, you know, it, it, this isn't a completed work, but to really, I think, capture the, the dialectic of, of nihilism, it would have been good for him as someone that was coming out of, of, of the US and out of that, uh, that wasp milieu to turn his attention back to American capitalism, back to Americanism, back to globalism. But again, this was in the middle of the Cold War and, and, and communism was obviously very much on people's minds. And so the, the nihilism of destruction, the final stage of nihilism ends with Bolshevism. But we could perhaps look at it now and see with the end of the Cold War and with the, the victory of, of liberalism and this idea of the end of history and this kind of global neoliberal capitalism now that is just eating everything up, that is doing more than the, the communist revolutions ever did to destroy these traditions, to make religion meaningless, to spread nihilism all over the world. We can maybe see this as, as the ultimate stage in the dialectic of nihilism. So, you know, that is something that would have been interesting for him to investigate more. I think some of his uh, characterizations of nature are maybe a little unfair, but then again, you know, he was, uh, he was very familiar with, with Nietzsche himself. But overall, this is an excellent work for someone that wants to get a, a, a not just a Christian, but a, a traditionalist critique of the modern world and a critique of the whole project of modernity going right back from the Enlightenment up to the modern age and how these things fit together. Because I think people often have trouble expressing, you know, they can point to the horrors of, of communism, they can point to the destructive tendencies of the ideologies of the modern world, but they have trouble contextualizing this and relating it back to um, earlier uh, philosophical trends, things like classical liberalism, things like logical positivism, and how any of these things are, are related. And Sarah from Rose does a, a good job with this idea of the necessary dialectic of nihilism and tying these things together. So that is nihilism, the root of the revolution of the modern age, uh, Father Sarah from Rose. I would recommend this book. It isn't the longest book. Again, you could read this in a day or two. So, um, yeah, if someone is thinking of, of purchasing this, that's something to keep in mind. And, uh, yeah, I hope everyone will join me next weekend, as always. Uh, thanks to everyone who supports this channel.